Welcome back to the Lamppost Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. But this is not one of those chapters today. Today we are going to be talking about the BBC's adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Welcome back, Phil. Thanks. It's good to be back. Yes, we are so excited today. We've been talking about it all season long. We've brought in a special guest who's about to introduce himself. We are finally going to be talking about this incredible, uh, it's the only word I can think to describe it, adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Would you like to introduce yourself, Trent? Well, yeah. So my name is Trent, for those yeah. of you. <laughs> and um, I've been a friend of Daniel since middle, middle school, high school. And yeah. I think I'm here because he knows, as we are pop cultural aficionados, that these films have a special, special place in my heart. Yes, and I think it's great that you use the word film there because right off the back, we need to talk a little bit about what this thing is <laughs> because uh, the BBC's adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it is a British serial that aired from November of 1988 to December of 1988, and it was six episodes long, six episodes in the series. But now, in most places where you would purchase this or watch it, it is... It hasn't been shortened, but they've kind of taken off the bookends of the opening credits and the end credits to each episode, and they've just lumped it into one long, I mean, a long uh, movie, like almost three hours long. So we are, we're going to be talking about those episodes just as a way to kind of guide us through this discussion. But I, I think, I know Phil and I watched this as one long movie. Did you do the same thing, Trent? I did, and I tried to remember from my childhood where the episode breaks were because I had a vivid memory of one of the episode breaks being like when there was one of the wolf characters shouting at the children. Um, but I'm now not confident that that is true because the version I watched had no episode breaks whatsoever. Well, and this is a good time to ask you, Trent, what? how did you first experience this adaptation? Because I think for a lot of us, especially for those of us in our, our late 20s, like this was a thing that we grew up with, like as, as kids. Was this similar for you? Yeah, like all good things in my life, my first experience with this came from the public library. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up going to the public library all the time, and I read the Narnia books and loved them. And this was before the uh, more modern 2000s adaptations of the film. So I found these on the shelf. And this, was, this one was released, I think, as two VHS tapes. So it was like mm-hmm. three episodes and then three episodes so I have vivid memories of switching the VHS tape, seeing the sort of grainy VHS rendering, uh, and watching it over and over so many times that uh, even when I was older, I asked, they released it as a DVD box set with the other two miniseries that the BBC released. And I asked for those for like Christmas or something. That's how much I loved watching these movies. We brought in an expert. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that So do you currently own them, Trent? I, I do. That's not how I watch them this time because they remain at my parents' abode. Um, okay. But I do still own them. And I suppose I should go ahead and say up front, my favorite of the BBC's adaptations was they they also did The Silver Chair. And that was mm-hmm. the adaptation that I enjoyed the most as a kid. Uh-huh. So, Phil, did you also grow up with this? I did, yeah. So I, I got mine from the church library. And there was only so much content available to, you know, people my age I think I was like seven or eight when I first watched them Um, but it was you know when you're a kid and you haven't seen anything else and special effects weren't really that great at that time either um, it was like really exciting to see and Trent the silver chair is the one that is like the most embedded in my memory and I'm looking forward to getting to that in a couple years Uh, that's the one that uh, I remember the most as well in terms of the visuals but I will say Getting the DVD copies of this has made me remember Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe simply because the special features were very limited on the DVD, but one (laughs) was a recipe for Turkish delight. Uh, (laughs) Oh, wow. And once you've eaten it, you will never understand Edmund's motivations ever again because it is not good. No, we, we, I think we talked about this on the show. It was magical Turkish delight. And that's the only way it could have tempted him because it's, Turkish delight is gross. Hold on, I have a question about this. Was the special feature one that you had to put in a DVD-ROM 
on your computer to download the PDF of the recipe, or was it just displayed on the screen on your TV? No, you put it into your computer and downloaded the recipe, and then once you had the recipe, you <laughs> like it wasn't like a cool. What I wanted was a cool like cooking show where the actor for Edmund like showed yeah. me how to make Turkish delight, and what I got was a weird recipe for essentially lemon jello with powdered sugar <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, yeah, that's it's. Maybe maybe we'll do uh, between one of the later books where we don't have adaptations to talk about. Maybe we'll all get together and we'll eat Turkish Delight on air. I'm sure people would love to hear that. <laughs> That'd be a good uh, a video podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great um, ASMR. Like the- that's that's what I was thinking of, too. That's a big thing. People eating stuff. So, um, <laughs> so obviously, listeners, if you can't tell, this is a much more uh, casual episode for us. But we're really just excited to be able to take a take a you know, exhale after season one of the show and then just kind of enjoy these adaptations, which I think we all would agree are not as good as the book, uh, but still have a lot of great merit to them of their own. So I'd, I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts. Do y'all like this adaptation? Do we not like it? Do you think it's better than the book? Uh, I'll start and say I do still really like it. Um, I definitely have nostalgia goggles. I I will be the first to admit it. I still like Digimon Adventure and like uh, that's hard to say you still like as an adult. Uh-huh. But um, <laughs> this in particular, what I think I like about it is it's very clearly constructed to appeal to children. Uh, and I think the books are as well. Um, and it focuses primarily not on like camera flourishes or cool aesthetic choices. It's primarily like this is a vessel to tell a story. So a lot of it is shot in like medium shots. There's very little like ingenuity or crazy craftsmanship. I mean, there's a lot of craftsmanship in terms of the makeup and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Uh, But in terms of the visual presentation, it's just a story. And like, it's hard to make the story of Narnia not a story that you can get drawn into. Um, So I really still, I think it holds up. I still enjoyed watching it. uh, And I think it's got a cool position in the canon of Narnia content. Absolutely. I am personally so glad it was made when it was just because right now we have way more access to special effects and stuff. And I think there would be much more emphasis on that, especially if they make the Netflix series like they're talking about. But to me, this was more like watching a play, um, but just like a, a filmed version of a play. And all the sets were kind of a little bit more still. Uh, they put a lot of work into the sets, which I really enjoyed. Um, but it was also really fun to see uh, them take the dialogue almost word for word for the entire movie and put that in there. And it was like they just made a movie from the book. It was like a direct one-to-one copy. And I think it worked really well, especially for considering like when it was made. I think that point, I think that's a great strength, but also a huge weakness of it is the they really are just translating it from book to screen. Like there aren't, they don't really take a lot of liberties. You, I would say I'm making this number up, but to me, it seems like at least half of the dialogue is word for word C.S. Lewis, which you can't go wrong because it's C.S. Lewis. But in other ways, you you know, one is a book and one is a movie slash serial, and so I think it's like I think it really works sometimes, and then other times it really kind of falls flat. And I I don't think it's just with the uh. The dialogue, I think there's sometimes, even with some of the costume choices, I think for the most part, I really enjoy a lot of them. But sometimes I would have been okay with, let's just make that something different that's easier to show on screen. But, I mean, if we have to say one thing about the production team behind this, they were committed to to getting this story right. I really do believe that. I agree. Yeah, I think it's evidenced in, like, I was I watched it with a buddy, and we were just kind of, like, blown away Uh Granted, it's aged very strangely, and I think Phil had a great point when he said it looks like a theater production. But when you look at like the beavers' makeup, like that's time, that's dedication. Like their mouths look like beavers' mouths, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of attention to having giving that storybook feel uh, to the production is it pays off. Still, I still can like appreciate the workmanship. So. Yeah, for sure. It doesn't. It doesn't look like they didn't try. It looks like they did a really good job with what they had. With since you just brought up the beavers, I uh, I did a little bit of research about this, and I had a couple pieces of trivia I want to just throw in every once in a while. And one of the things that was really great that I read is that Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's costumes 
uh, were very hard to use in the snow. <laughs> and so there were actually assistants that were called the beaver retriever retrievers that would stand around to pick up the actors every time they'd fall over. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Entirely yeah. unsurprising. I, which I looked in the credits. It's not there. I really wanted beaver retrievers to be there, but it is not actually in the credits. Uh, but I, I, I love that that existed. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, so let's let's do this. Let's start going through episode by episode and just talk about some of the things that jump out to us. So the first episode of the series starts at the very beginning of the book and goes right up to Edmund going into the wardrobe and meeting the white wit- white witch. Excuse me. So it's it's really about the first three chapters of the book and. Anything jump out to y'all kind of in that first sixth of the story? Um, For me, the thing that jumped out the most, well, there were two things that really stood out. Uh, And the first is I think the design for the White Witch was great. Like, I really like her costume design. Um, I think it captured a lot of the sort of, like, menace while also still being something that looked regal. And you could conceivably see Edmund sort of reacting to that in a way where he's not terrified. He's sort of, it feels familiar and authoritative. Um, and the other is that I, uh, what they tried to do for Mr. Tumnus and Lucy and like Lucy seeing dreams and the flames and sort of seeing the partying, uh, I appreciate what they tried to do. Uh, but that was one of the first moments where I was kind of like the limitations of your budget, uh, are th- pulling me out of the story because the camera just kind of does the classic like dream meld between the fireplace fires, Mr. Tumnus plays his flute and then suddenly a scene of like revelers, a dwarf and some fawns drinking and being married together. Uh, and that scene to me, that transition and suddenly switching from the like beautiful set of Mr. Tumnus's abode to the reveling was the first moment in where I was kind of like, Oh, this is really old. And they had real limitations. I have the same notes, uh, but after I put about the... You're talking about Narnia before winter, right? When we see it kind of in springtime? Yes, yeah. I put next to it, I love it in all caps. I, I thought it was one. I, do, I feel very differently than you. I, I re, That was like one of my favorite things. We don't really see it like that in the book. We just kind of hear about it and C.S. Lewis writes about it. But here, I lo- I thought it was... Beautiful. I, I don't know. I just, I really stuck with me. I remembered that imagery from a, as a child. I should say, I have not watched this since I was probably eight or nine years old. But I, I really, really liked it. And it made me kind of visualize what we're fighting for in Narnia. Like, it was really cool because I was like, oh, this is what we're trying to return to. And I, I especially think that for children watching it, it's good to, for them to be able to visualize, here is what's at stake. That's what was lost. And that's what we want to return to. So I, I really liked it. I think one of the hardest things to do is to keep people in the story. And I think, Trent, you make a really good point there. Special effects, even if they're really good, if they don't match the overall aesthetic of a piece, can be really distracting and pull you out of a story. And I think in this case, like they were kind of limited by the budget and we're also watching it so many years later that it's not exactly fair to the production team, but the, the scenes where they have like 50% opacity overlaying one scene on another scene are very distracting. Cause it's like, this is like a funny choice. Um, especially like watching it from the year 2018. Yeah. And I think like Daniel, you make a really good point that that is sort of the visualization of what Narnia could be and should be. Um, and isn't at the moment. Uh, For me, what was, I think, most striking about it wasn't the transition and wasn't the choice to visualize it uh, so much as it was like, we're in this really warm, intimate space with Mr. Tumnus and Lucy. Um, The set for Mr. Tumnus was so cluttered and so cool, and the scene where she's reading uh, his book titles feels like she's just exploring the safe space. Uh, And then suddenly the color shift, like the color palette shift from those like earth tones and and dark reds and browns uh to the bright spring greens of of narnia just was kind of like where are we and why are we suddenly here um for me as a as a viewer and i think it even probably threw me a little bit as a kid because it's one of the first times also that we see some of the denizens of narnia that we've never met before like we see 
happy dwarves and happy fawns and happy nymphs uh, that we haven't met before and see them in this very starkly different palette. Let's talk about that set. What an incredible set for Mr. Tonus's house. <laughs> well, bef- here, I'll get my one critique out of the way, and then we can talk about how great it is. Uh, Mr. Tumnus, guys, has an electric lamp plugged into his house. <laughs> there is, in one of the shots, there is an electric lamp plugged. Like, it's not a flicker. It's not like a lampshade with has a candle behind it. Like, it is an actual light bulb lamp. So th- that was my only thing that I just feel like it's so anachronistic that it really took me out of the story. And this is when you were eight, right? No, this is when, no. Yeah, when I was eight, I was like, I, I can't believe uh, this no, happened. No, that, that, that's wrong. Yeah. It's electric. I was kind of annoying back then, too. So. Uh, I believe it. What were you it. saying, Trip? I was just saying, are yeah. we not supposed to, like, is Mr. Thomas not supposed to be an intellectual? Like, can we not believe that he would <laughs> he's have, cr- you know, he's created the electric <laughs> lamp <laughs> and is just keeping it to himself for now? <laughs> yeah, he's not telling anyone else. He's like, guys, I have it. I have created electricity. We could literally melt all the snow and use it maybe to fight the, the, the witch's magic, but instead I'm just going to use it so I can read a book in my house. Sounds like Mr. <laughs> Tumnus to me. Yeah. I mean, we know he's kind of a coward here at the beginning of this book. Uh, I think I think he spent more time on electrical engineering than he did on his history and geography and as geography, a little fun. Since right. he'd never heard Ge- of Yeah, geography. Room. Yeah. Spare oom, um, yeah, yeah. He really just needs to get his ears clean because that's not a geography thing. That's just made up words that he's mishearing. Yeah. Uh, but tell us, Phil, what did you really like about his his set? Uh, it was packed. So much detail in there. I love the portrait of his father, um, which comes into play, I think, in the next episode, right? I th- Where they go back. No, I think we see it in this one, too. But I think we see it ripped up by, spoiler alert, we see it ripped That's up. That's what by I mean. Yeah. We, <laughs> we see it in the beginning, but then it's, like, ripped up later. And it's, like, they reused that well. Um, yeah, and I know you liked it because you actually clapped when we watched it together. And they showed, <laughs> oh, it's it's Bill such got a good very portrait. excited when he saw the portrait. It's a great set, like the level of detail. And Mr. Tumnus is perhaps my favorite character in all of Narnia. Um, oh, wow. And for two reasons. One, I think he's like... Have you, have you read all the books, Trent? I, I have. Uh, I think <laughs> okay. he's a cool... Phil like, hasn't, so... <laughs> I think he's a cool, like, redemptive character. Um, yeah. He and Edmund both have good turns from being like cowardly to actually trying to do the right thing. Um, but I also really like him because I played him in a church production what? of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, as a child. And I wore sweatpants oh, with fake fur sewn on the outside. Did you and go shirtless? I did not because I was, oh, I, was I mean, I, one, I was a child and two, yeah, that's it what was, was at like my church. Uh, I wore a brown <laughs> polo, like a brown polo, and <laughs> I had great. a big red scarf, and I had fake <laughs> hobbit ears and, like, the horns and stuff. And at the time, my hair was, like, super long and really curly, so uh, I really fit the part, I felt like. Um, I think you did. I was going to yeah. say, it sounds like typecasting. Yeah. It definitely <laughs> you're was. You're only going to be able to play those characters. It was not based on talent. I can guarantee that. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> this guy looks like he could be a fawn. Let's get him in here. <laughs> so let, let's talk about that real quick. It's a little funny that... He's walking around in the snow, and he has his coat on, and then he comes back, and he just immediately takes his shirt off when he's in his house. This was another it's... good detail in the production, though, because when his shirt is off in this scene, he's, like, extra hairy. But then when we see a, like, Mr. Tumnus in springtime, uh, he's not nearly... Has he shaved? Yeah, yeah, exactly. He doesn't have all his winter coat. Uh, wow. I didn't notice that. That's great. <laughs> Let's talk about the casting for the Pevensies because one of my biggest nitpicks is that Richard Dempsey, who plays Peter, I think he does actually a very good job in this, but he easily looks like he could be the youngest of all the siblings. I mean, it's, I, I feel like just the casting for the kids, I don't think any of the actors are, are bad or anything, but just if you were to line all four of them up and then say who is who, you probably wouldn't pick who the BBC picked, or at least I wouldn't. I I think I would. Uh, I, yeah? I don't know that I... I don't think he looks at younger than the others, particularly not younger than, like, Lucy. I think Lucy is very well cast. Um, maybe Edmund and he are... It's hard to sort of differentiate age-wise. Uh-huh. Um, but again, just based on, like, the type of character they're meant to be playing, I think the casting makes sense. Um, and Edmund does a good job performing that kind of petulance. Uh, oh, Yeah. So I I don't I don't see that, and I think Susan is always meant to look 
almost Peter's peer in age. Um, and in this casting does like Susan to me is the one that looks like the eldest and as well as in the Disney adaptations. And I think that that makes sense. Like, I think that that is cool and accurate. Well, it also makes sense because Susan is in a lot of ways more mature than Peter in, in, in some ways, not a lot of ways, but in some ways in this book, Peter can kind of be a little headstrong. We know that, you know, even just in some of the ways he interacts before they get to Narnia, he's almost like immature because he thinks he's so mature, you know? And I think one mm. of the things that Richard Dempsey does well as Peter is he conveys that he's the oldest a lot through his body language and through the tone of voice he's using towards the rest of the kids. It's so much this like, even though I think he's only one year older than Susan, he's talking like he's everyone's dad. And in some ways he needs to step into that because their parents are no longer around right now. But he almost like does it to a annoying degree, a, you know, he does it in an annoying way. And I, I love, I, I really think that the four kids, they interact really well together. I think, I think they're a good cast. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think that's a really good point about the kind of feigned maturity. Uh, that works pretty well here. I think he's performing like since they're taken to the country, like relatively young and they're thrust into this situation. There's a lot of subtext that we can read into it, right? Like the wartime subtext where all of them have to perform a version of like a more mature self that they haven't even had the time to learn what it Mm -hmm. should look like because they haven't Mm. had the time with a role model or with their parents. And so Peter's just kind of like doing what, He's he's only embodying the version of leadership that is like confidence. Like that seems to be like his big is like father knows best. And so rather than having the nuance, like these are all the ways that a leader needs to take care of his entourage. Like um, he just knows one and he just does it all the way. And Edmund just knows like one thing. And and Lucy just kind of knows like peacemaking and kindness and so, like, they all kind of seem to have one big shtick. And to me, their arc is developing into tempering that down and adding other elements to their characters. One other thing we haven't discussed is the music for the for the serial yet. And it really comes, it hits us full force right at the beginning of this first episode. Um, the, the name of the main theme is Aslan's Theme by Jeffrey Burgeon. I might have pronounced that incorrectly. I've done that a lot on this show, so... Uh, and it is used heavily throughout this serial. Do y'all like it? Do we, is it overused? Do we just like, oh man, I can't hear that one more time? Or were you guys just humming it all week long after you watched this? The moment I hear it, it brings me back simply because like it's instrument, it, like the instrumentation of it is so classic fantasy, and it's not something we hear anymore. Like rich horns and sort of like the fanfare, the almost medieval fanfare. Uh, we, that's not an often used thing in film score nearly as much as like the inception um, dang it Hans Zimmer (laughs) so so I think I I mean it's not like gonna last in my memory necessarily the way like the score for the Lord of the Rings will as like a landmark high bar for scoring but it's memorable and it's super fun I think in my opinion it is the most memorable thing from this entire serial for me like the thing that sticks with me more than anything else, not even imagery, is that theme. Like that to me, more than any of the themes written, and I really we'll talk about this. I really like the the score for the Disney adaptation, the for the Disney adaptation of this book, but Aslan's theme to me is Narnia's theme. And maybe it's maybe it's again it's those nostalgia goggles that I have because I you know, I, that's more familiar to me than the Disney one is. But I, I mean I absolutely love it. Well, let's talk about what it was like when we first started watching it. We were blown away by the score. It brought back all those memories. We liked it a lot. And then about seven hours into watching it, <laughs> it was like, wow, they're they're really like using this theme a lot. I don't think... And I, <laughs> yeah. And like after nine hours of that, you're like, man, that's like... It just... It, I think it was used a lot, but I don't... I also don't know if I would have noticed. Daniel has much better hearing and a much... Um, better sense of like what's going on music wise in scores um, or in films. So I think that it was Daniel pointing it out every time it came on that made me realize just how much it was used, but it definitely transports you instantly, like back to when you first watched it, which says a lot about how well crafted it is. Well, you know, I think there's a fine line between writing a beautiful piece of music and then finding ways to manipulate it so it can serve as uh 
in different scenes and have different tones. And I think for the most part, it works really, really well. Like it can be kind of the music's playing as we're walking into Narnia and we're kind of seeing this magical world. It can be used in other ways of kind of the sense of Aslan coming as as the the frost is melting away. And then I thought there were some inappropriate times it was used, like as Aslan's dying. It feels weird to hear his theme in a very regal way. Like I could see maybe finding a way to play it in this kind of uh, sad or tragic way, maybe even changing up. Maybe I don't know if it's minor or major, but if you know, just even switching that a little bit, so we just it feels a little bit more dissonant to us. But even like as he's dying, they play it in a very regal way, and I was like, this feels weird. And maybe that's maybe that was a choice. Like, hey, we know he's going to come back to life, and so therefore this death is like a noble death. I don't know, but there were a couple times where I did feel like it was out of place, and they did use it a little too much. And it feels like it was one of the only pieces of music they wrote for the entire movie. <laughs> Yeah, I can totally see where you're coming from with that. Let's talk about the flute, though. That kind of factors into the music, too. The double flute. The one that Mr. Thomas plays? That's right, yeah. How, how did you feel about it? I liked it. I I actually really... I don't want to do too much comparison uh, between the two, but I, I like the Narnian lullaby that Harry Gregson Williams wrote for the Disney version a little bit more, but I I do enjoy what they have here. I th- I think in this movie, it's... It does feel Narnian as well, too, but I just think I have a hard time disconnecting it from what's one of my favorite pieces of music in really all of cinema is that Narnian lullaby. And so it's hard for me to, to, not, to not compare the two. I think it's such a short uh, period. Like, I think it's effective, um, but it's certainly not a piece that sticks out to me because it's a short little performance. Um, and I don't remember the music. I remember more like the narrative function that it plays, which I think is sort of how I feel about this entire adaptation is I don't necessarily, I remember images and I remember like sensations, but more than anything, it feels like a vessel to tell a story uh, like you were mentioning earlier on. Um, and so some of those details, while awesome, and, and we'll get to another detail that I really love in the next chapter, uh, but they, they kind of just become snippets of memory and the rest is just the, the story as it is told direct from the page of the book to the screen. I think one way it really works well is they don't play some other music that's impossible to make with a flute. It sounded like he was actually playing the flute or the recorder or whatever it was. <laughs> it looked to me like a double recorder, like the kind you get in elementary school. I think it would have been um, better if he had whipped out a real recorder and just started yeah. like <laughs> trying to play it really poorly. Like That's like such like a parody movie kind of thing, but I think I would have really enjoyed it at this point <laughs> in the story. <laughs> like Dwight Schrute in the office, just like that terrible, like playing it too hard yeah. sound. Well, do we have any other things about chapter one before we move into chapter two? Or episode two, I should say. I think I think I'm ready. Episode two's got right. some stuff. So So episode two begins with the arrival of the White Witch in front of Edmund as he's now gone into Narnia and it ends with the four Pevensies all together in Narnia at Mr. Tumnus's house reading Malgrim's letter. Do we want to just start and talk about Malgrim's letter? I mean, I think that's the best part of this whole chapter. I I don't know if you guys can confirm or deny, but for me, my most vivid memory of this uh, was as a kid, I feel like that's where the first VHS ended. Um, and I could be wrong, but I, for some reason, I remember like seeing Mogram's face superimposed on the letter, sort of roaring out at the kids after he's read it all out loud. And then like very not scarily now roaring. But as a kid, I think I was kind of like, ooh, spooky. Um, <laughs> but I remember that being the place where I had to switch the VHS. Like I, I have no idea if that is true or not, but I have a vivid memory of like having to crawl up to my VCR and switch the VHS after Margaret and being like scared that he was going to jump. Like I don't want to take <laughs> out the VHS; it might it might get me. I don't I don't remember, so I can neither confirm nor deny that that's that's what happened. Yeah, I'd have to do some research to find out. <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean, we mentioned this just a second ago, but they are really confident in this overlaying of a person's face onto the rest of the screen. They do it, I think, four different times in throughout this, you know, two hours and 50 minutes that we have. They do it when the kids 
hear the name of Aslan. They do it when spring is coming with the Pevensey kids. And they, maybe it's just three times. And they do it here with Morgan reading the letter. And I really only think it works here. I don't think it works in the other places very well. But I, I mean, this is scary. I really like the idea. And we've mentioned it on the show when we got to uh, this part in the book that it's it is very, very memorable hearing it just switch from Peter's voice to Malgram's voice, and it, it does frighten you as a kid. Yeah, I love that switch. That's a great switch. So, Trent, it does at the 57 mark, that's where the, the letter is read, and then it does end that part. I don't know if that's where the VHS ended, but that's certainly where that episode ended. Okay. So maybe it was just, but all I know is like, it was that is the moment of all the moments in this entire series. Uh, that is the moment that sticks out in my brain the most. Uh, and I think maybe it's just because it's like our first visual of this character. And to me, what was cool about it is the the kids are reading this letter that would be terrifying to them. And it almost seems as if it's totally plausible that this transition is something that they're seeing because we're in a magical world. So there's no reason Margrim, like theoretically couldn't have imbued this letter with his sort of energy and I don't know, magically programmed it like a Mission Impossible thing to like self-destruct with his roaring face once read. <laughs> um, but so like for me, like I thought that was such a cool way to up the ante of how this letter terrifies the kids. It, it's a visual cue to let uh, viewers know like the Pevensies find this letter deeply disturbing and so should we. Yeah, it's definitely like an uh, it's an emotional punch when they get that letter. Let's walk back, and I know this is my fault because I got so excited to talk about Margaret's letter. But can we walk back now and kind of go through chronologically and start talking a little bit more about Barbara Kellerman as the White Witch? I know we, we got to hear you, your thoughts, Trent, on her on her costume, which I think are really really good points. But do we do we like her as the White Witch? Do we feel like it's hard? I'd some, are we trying to compare her too much to Tilda Swinton in the Disney version? I mean. Like, wh- how do you all think that she does with this part? I, I think it's really unfair because I think Tilda Swinton is great, like one of the best actresses of her generation. Um, sure, sure. And so I think she does a great job as the White Witch, and I think what she does really well is the waffling between menace and like saccharine caretaking. I don't think that's done as well here. Um, the performance never feels like genuinely trying to connive and convince Edmund that she's nice the menace is always there um and that like makes it hard for me as a viewer because I can't believe that Edmund gets duped duped by it which I think we're really supposed to believe Edmund's being magically influenced Edmund's insecurities are being played on like he's he's at fault for his weaknesses but he's also like being tempted in very real very powerful ways so like he's also able to be forgiven for his betrayal. And here it's just kind of like Edmund. She's obviously evil. Like it's so clear because I don't think she does a great job of waffling between the two modalities. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's because it's a hundred percent evil all the time. And she always has that like mean smile going on. I think that it's a little bit, um, it's just kind of difficult to bear with that the entire time. But maybe that's also like me disliking the character a lot. It, she may be like doing the role perfectly, and I just don't like that character, which happens a lot. When you say you don't like the character, do you mean you don't like the White Witch because she's bad, or you just don't think she's a good character? The first one, yeah, I think she's a great character. Okay. It's just like she's a her character is a bad person. I got you. That makes sense. There's the the one part after they've kind of uh, are parting ways where Edmund asks for more Turkish delight, and she just screams at the top of her lungs, "No." Yeah. And uh, that's one thing that really took me. Like, I actually really like that she she's ve- she's really hamming it up, and I don't I don't mean that in like a bad way. I really don't. But I mean, she reminds me of Ian McDermott in the prequels, with like he was just completely like bought into. I am going to be Emperor Palpatine. I'm going to do a really like, especially in in Revenge of the Sith. Like he is just fully bought in. It's like, look, I'm just going for it at this point. This is we, we all know this is ridiculous. So I'm just going to buy in, and she's. Doing that, I think, in a lot of ways, which is why it's sometimes hard to believe that she's tricking Edmund because she is so, you know, almost overacting in some ways. And I actually think it works in a lot of ways. But when she does the no, I completely am taken out of the story. And it brings <laughs> me back to Darth Vader's no in Revenge of the uh, Sith. So. Oh, man. Why'd you do that? Or uh, the 2011 
Blu-ray release of the original trilogy where Darth Vader now says no as he, spoiler alert, it came out almost 40 years ago, when he's throwing the Emperor down the shaft of the Death Star 2, and he now he says no too. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's... No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You can come over to my house. I have the uh, un- unedited, unspecial, the despecialized editions. <laughs> Okay, there's one problem with those, though. They took out the Han Solo, I love you, I know line. That's not true. They They're still a- there. No, they took it out in one of the despecialized versions. And I was like, you guys messed up the edit. Like, <laughs> you had one job to do. <laughs> took out too much I, stuff. I have the versions exactly as they appeared in 77, 80, and 83 in the, uh, in the theater. We have no way to verify that. <laughs> That's true. We'll have to get the time it, machine. It was my parents' first date, so just have my dad watch it, and he'll tell you. Oh, good. You think he was thinking about that? Uh, I think he was <laughs> recording <laughs> it like verbatim in his memory. He was like, yeah, I'm not concerned that I'm on a date with the woman I'll marry. I'm concerned about this awesome sci-fi movie, and I need to what? record it for posterity. This changes everything. <laughs> the rest of his life was different from that night. <laughs> yeah. Um do you, I mean, do y'all remember when the White Witch says no, or is that something that just stuck out to me because I'm such a Star Wars nerd? Uh, I remember a lot of moments where she switches <laughs> to just, like, screaming something. She and Margaret <laughs> yeah. both, like, their performances are defined by howling uh, to punctuate their scary <laughs> moments. And now, as someone who's been editing this podcast for uh, the past year now, <laughs> I... I realize, and I've been like working with audio stuff. There's a couple of times where they like max out their mics. Like it doesn't come through. And I know this was recorded or, you know, created, you know, 30 years ago or so, but there's a couple of times where their levels are like bursting through and you can kind of hear the mic just like almost cutting out on a couple of their <laughs> yells. I'm just like, someone had to have caught that better. So I think for the yell that you're talking about where she screams no. You can see a little a little hint of a smile on Edmund's face. <laughs> it's almost like he's trying not to break. It's so funny. He's like, oh, oh, no. That's great. So then Edmund goes back, in, and Lucy, they both go back into the, the house. They go back through into our world. And there's one scene I just have to mention that I really, really like that's in addition to the book. It's not there in the book. And it's something that wouldn't have necessarily worked as much in, in a book. But Lucy is drawing. I think she's drawing like Mr. Thomas or something from Narnia. And Edmund just walks into a room. He picks up the drawing. He just like looks at it with disgust and just gives it back. And that is the most like sinister big brother like jerk move you can make. And I, I, I loved that scene. I think the scenes with uh, the children like Edmund and Lucy, the Pevensies back from Narnia after their first forays are all really effective save for one. Um, and it's when uh, Peter and Susan are concerned about who's telling the truth. Because Edmund, with that like disdainful, I think Edmund's like knowing, right? He's totally aware now that Lucy's telling the truth, and sure, he's sure. choosing to be like, no. But and I, he's been tempted and tainted already. You know, he already has this image of himself becoming king of Narnia. Um, but the scene where then the two older siblings go to talk to the old man of the house and the line delivery and the pacing of that, as we've talked about, is straight page to page to page. Uh, and that's one of the moments where there's a huge weakness. So you just brought out a moment where like something not in the book is a huge strength. And then this is a moment where playing it straight from the book is a huge weakness because that scene takes a decade. Yeah, and it stinks because that's one of my favorite scenes in the book. I mean, we talked, that's in chapter five, and we spent so much time talking about that and, and talking about Lewis is really letting a lot of his voice shine in that scene and it just it falls really flat I, that, I would agree that that's one of my least favorite parts of this entire adaptation I really don't think they get it right which is ironic because they're literally playing it straight from the book but it just it doesn't translate from page to screen it's evidence of the way where like when you make an adaptation you do need to make some accommodations for the medium and so like that is a great way where Perhaps in the book, we can just sort of write about the internal experiences of these characters. We can have them speak to one another, but it's so much more impactful when we have the option of visual to show Edmund take an action. Actions speak louder than words, right? So take an action that demonstrates his sort of dismissal of Lucy and and her version of Narnia. Mm. I think that that's so difficult. 
forget what it was, but in high school, people had complained about two or three movies in a row. They're like, oh, this, like the book was so much better. They changed too much stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then a movie came out and it was like an exact one-to-one copy of the book. And everyone complained about that. They're like, yeah, they didn't even change anything. It was just like exactly like the book. I'm like, what do you people want? And it's really hard to like find that balance where you want to, you have to change some things because it's a different medium. But if you change too much stuff, then people are upset. You know, I I have always thought that the the I the way you get an adaptation right is you you try to understand what the author was intending because you can't you can't recapture the same thing and that's why I've always thought that the Lord of the Rings are such good adaptations. There's big things that they don't that they take out and I'm I've been recently rereading uh, Lord of the Rings this year and I always forget. Oh man, like Gandalf says that in the movie version of Fellowship, but that's actually here in Return of the King, or this is this line, and there's so many things that are like rearranged, and it's not a one-for-one adaptation. There's a lot of things that change, especially uh, with Fellowship. Even the pacing is so drastically different, but I I think they get the heart right. Like, I I think they get, in a lot of ways, and this is my opinion. I know, like, Christopher Tolkien would disagree with me. I think they get a lot of the spirit of the book correct, and that's what makes it work. And I also think that's what makes the Disney version of Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe work, and maybe not, not maybe, but and what makes the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Fox's adaptation of that, f- does not work because they, they get the spirit of the book wrong. And I, I think that's, and I think for the most part here with BBC's adaptation that we're watching right now, I think for the most part they get it right. And that's why despite some production quality issues, despite some just like taking things word for word, they they it mostly, they stick the landing for the most part. But there are a couple of times like this where I just think, they, they kind of miss what C.S. Lewis was trying to communicate here. I think it's like, I agree with you about Lord of the Rings wholeheartedly. And I, yeah, they're the, my favorite adaptations of anything from one medium to another. Uh, and I think even some of the changes they make thematically work because they change Aragorn's character pretty significantly. But it works really well because a more like moody and conflicted Aragorn gives somebody something to do with their performance as compared to having Aragorn be like super confident here. What I think we're missing is that scene in the book has that sense of kind of like, uh, hope and mysticism and almost, I don't know, coy back and forth where there's obviously things that are known by both halves that aren't being said. And here, all of that sort of secrecy and shared, uh, magic is lost because it's just kind of like a, a stilted conversation across a desk back and forth. Um, and so none of the magic of that conversation and the implication and the kind of like go push to go find answers and, and have faith is there. It's just kind of, yeah, trust your sister, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, moving on from that, what do we think of the transition into Narnia as the four kids, you know, race into the wardrobe and get into Narnia? Is that, is that, I mean, that's a really, really big part of this story. Is that memorable to y'all? I, I remember it as one of the only times the camera isn't in medium shot. Uh, mm-hmm. And for that, I really like it. Like, because it's demonstrating the creators are trying to find a way to visualize these things that are described in the story, visualize these experiences using the the tools that they have at their disposal. I like the one line where well, we talked about it a lot as we read through the book, but they all get into the wardrobe. Edmund tries to shut it, and Peter's like, never shut yourself in a wardrobe, stupid, and just like <laughs> throws it back open. And I, I, I love that that's still – and that's, to me – that's a great way of taking this thing that C.S. Lewis does as the as the narrator, and he says, you know, because you know Lucy always knew what well, you should never set yourself up in a wardrobe, and he, and obviously we can't have that happen in the movie. So what happens is we see Peter just very un- frustrated with his brother throw the wardrobe door open, which I really like. I just imagine when they were writing the script, they're like, "Do we really need this in there?" And like, yeah, he mentioned it like three times in one page. Yes. It's going, it's got, going in. If there's one thing C.S. Lewis wanted us to get from this book, there were no supposals or allegories that we've talked about. Instead, please don't play in wardrobes with the, and shut the door. That's right. So any other last things about this chapter two, episode two here before we move on? Um, I mean, I think it, I think it ends at a weird 
boy, weird but awesome place. And I think that's what leads us so like it's one of the best to end and lead us into the next chapter. You're left on that wonderful clip cliffhanger. So I can see how it would work as a broadcast serial. Like I want to know what happens after they read this letter. Do you have any idea how long, um, how much time passed in between each episode airing for the first time? Well, it aired in November of of eighty eight and December, and then uh, concluded in December of eighty eight. So I I would just assume six weeks back to back. I, I don't know that for sure. That's just my assumption that they would just go like straight for six week. weeks. Yeah. But I don't know. We'll have to ask Trent's dad. It was it was the thirteenth <laughs> of November to the twenty third of December. So that adds up, right? Okay. May- I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if only we had some kind of tool to look at a calendar in front of us all. <laughs> hey, listeners, if you guys want a little bit of homework, could you let us know if those dates add up to six weeks, please? Um All right, well let's let's talk about chapter three here and we've got to talk guys this is where we finally see the infamous beaver costume so what are your thoughts i love it they've aged well um so i will say this mr beaver's makeup is remarkable because his face makeup actually looks almost like more fur when you look really closely and only if you look very closely do you realize that it's just sort of face paint that stops his upper lip from standing out because they don't change the shape of the actor's mouths at all. They give them a prosthetic like snout, but unless you look incredibly closely, it looks like the snout moves as part of a full mouth um, when they speak. Mrs. Beaver's costume does not have the same coloring and is like about three times creepier to me. Um, and they both have really oddly red teeth. That terrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, didn't you have a little bit of information on Mrs. Beaver? Yeah, so two facts. Mrs. Beaver, the actress who played Mrs. Beaver, and the actor who played Peter are both in Downton Abbey, which I haven't seen, but I've heard is quite popular. Yeah, so it's it's funny that Mrs. Beaver is the one who went on to do like more stuff. We looked at the IMDb, IMDb pages for everyone else, and it just they haven't been in anything that I've personally heard of, and from what I could tell. I'm not trying to be mean to Peter Dempsey again. No, no that's his name. Yeah, Peter Dempsey. No, Richard Dempsey, who plays yeah. Peter. But he in, in Downton Abbey, he played Footman in one episode, so it's not like he had like a starring role on the show. Well, then, yeah, Mrs. Beaver is probably the one to go on to do the most significant stuff. Yeah. Trent, do you know if of any of the other parts of these actors' careers? I mean, are you aware of anyone else going on to do anything besides this? No, which surprised me because, like, I really thought of it as maybe a launching pad. Um, but again, I think back on Phil's earlier comment about how it feels kind of like a theatrical production, and so often, perhaps, maybe that's where these actors really got their yeah got their success. And if that's the case, we're not going to find it on IMDb. There's no internet theater database that i'm aware of yeah it, i did click through both. some um <laughs> i did click through some um of the actors on wikipedia and someone was in a masterpiece theater type thing it looked like so that that's a very real possibility <laughs> also um there are three different people who are listed as credits um for playing aslan listed in the credits for playing aslan and I'm wondering if like one of them is doing the puppetry for the head and the mouth, and then if someone else is like the front two feet and someone else is the back two feet. And one of those three went on to do some stuff in Star Wars, Return of the Jedi. And I really hope that's the person who is doing the back feet. They, they climbed Why? their way up from back feet of Aslan to Star Wars <laughs> that's right. to, uh. to doing like Jabba the Hutt's left arm or something. Like just There was somebody I think that was in his tail. I, I might be wrong, but I, I think someone just, like not in his tail, but just hat was in charge of wiggling <laughs> Jabba's tail. I, I think I know what you're talking about. I think that's, yeah. that's a real thing. Probably him. <laughs> it's probably him. One of the things that gets me about the Beaver's costumes is the, the kids, not even their costumes, the Pevensies don't react at all to seeing a beaver the size of a human and the fact that it's talking. Like it, They're just like, oh, look, that's a beaver. That's what they look like. So are we to take it that in this version, in this universe that this movie takes place in, 
Do we think the beavers maybe look like that in their world too, or is this just <laughs> it's magical so they just don't bat an eye about it? Like, yeah, sure, it's you know. That's the biggest bummer of translating Narnia to film is it makes very clear Narnia's arbitrary distinction between magical talking and not magical talking animals. Um, mm-hmm. okay. Like they're just walking through the woods and there's just like a normal reindeer in the background, but uh, the beavers are six feet tall and can talk. Um, and I in the books, you don't really get hung up on that. But when you see it, you're kind of like, why aren't all the animals in humans in costumes? And w- yeah. why does Mogrim, when he turns into a wolf, turn into a German shepherd or something? Like, <laughs> So you, you have to sort of deal with these idiosyncras- idiosyncrasies that you don't have to deal with when you read a book and you can just imagine it. So my, my theory is that once you have walked inside a wardrobe been transported to a magic land and read a letter that has a wolf's face talking <laughs> to you. You're not really phased by Anything giant else. beavers yeah. that look like corn dogs. <laughs> they do kind of look like <laughs> corn dogs. <laughs> I am craving corn dogs so much right now and I don't even like them. <laughs> um again, we're we're ragging on it a lot. So let me let me say something that I really, really enjoy about this. Um again, we go back, the set design of the beaver's house is amazing i it it goes back the same things i loved about mr thomas's house it looks cramped it looks lived in the fact that it's not some heavily cgi like set or anything it feels real and it feels like everything has weight there and i i love it i really really like it yeah the long shot of them walking up to the dam uh and sort of like the snow falling in front of it and i think maybe it was a mini or maybe they did superimposed filming i don't know how they created it uh but like the the d- detail on the exterior of the house as well uh, is super good and really like it looks like a homey little beaver dam. Um, I love this set. This is my favorite set in the entire sort of mini series. And one thing that I like about the whole location as well too, it looks to me. I don't know this for sure, but it, it looks like they shot this on location somewhere. I'm assuming somewhere cold in England. I could be wrong. And the snow and just, like, the world itself, it all looks actually kind of, like, dirty. You know, like how when it's snowed for a long period of time and just by people walking around, it actually doesn't look like this winter wonderland. It's, like, there's dirt or you've had some pine needles fall down or something. Like, it's not this perfect, like, the night after a wonderful snowstorm kind of thing, which is what we see a little bit in the Disney versions and what I often pictured in the books. But I actually like that we get a very, like, lived-in winter here and in the BBC version. And I, I don't know if it's my favorite, but I think it's a really cool, you know, I, it probably was something that just happened because of just where they happened to film. But I like the idea and it makes it feel very real that like you have a, a whole forest with animals walking through it and just trees and stuff. You're not going to have this perfect winter wonderland. And so I really like that. Yeah, that's a really great detail. This is also where we very hear the first mention of Aslan's name. And again, we get the kids superimposed over, I guess, just the woods, I think it is, when, they're, when they hear it. <laughs> yeah, they all uh, just look up. Yeah. <laughs> and smile. It's like they, it looks like they got hit with something. <laughs> like someone threw gas in the room and it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do y'all do y'all like the shot or no? I kind of can. I don't. I don't like the shot at all. <laughs> I, that's a hard no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because because of what Trent was talking about earlier, it pulled me out of this story. It doesn't. It so, doesn't add up so yet. much. Like they don't. We don't really have a reason to. They don't have a reason to have this sort of like uh, euphoric reaction to the mention of Aslan's name. And of course, there's the understanding that like Aslan is symbolic and Aslan is good and wild and like is mystically known without being known and all these kinds of details but we as an audience don't know that and so unless we've read the books before so when we see kids just sort of look like they went to the dentist and got hit with laughing gas and (laughs) are now like sort of tilting back to have a tooth pulled like it doesn't make any sense to a viewer Um, And I think that's one of the other sort of weaknesses of this direct adaptation is it seems like it operates with the assumption that every good British person has read these books. So by the time the kids... Is that not an assumption we should be making, Trent? You know, maybe it is. But (laughs) like for that reason, um, 
as an adaptation for viewers who haven't read the books, I think it does kind of leave a lot to be desired in terms of world building because it's just kind of like, yep, uh, this is you, you already know this stuff. You are, you already know Aslan, so for the kids to already know isn't weird. Um. I agree. Yeah. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about in this third episode is Edmund. We all know he sneaks out of the Beaver's Dam and he he goes off towards the witch's house, and then we get probably the biggest departure from the entire book. And I want to hear y'all's thoughts on this. Throughout the journey, Edmund has a conversation with himself and we literally see i don't know what kind of maybe trent you can speak to the technology behind this but he literally has like a his conscience literally comes alive and we see we two images of edmund talking to himself so what's going on here (laughs) i i love it i i'm not entirely sure how they did it i i imagine it's something to do with layering the film and adjusting the opacity uh on the second take of edmund but I really love it because it lets us explore this character in a way that we would easily be able to do on page. And it, I mean, when I was watching it, I just sort of said to myself, it's Narnia Gollum, because like that's, <laughs> that's kind of what's yeah. happening. Um, but I think it is really effective because otherwise it would be very easy for us to view Edmund as strictly a like petulant, terrible kid. And here we're getting insight into some of his motivations and his sense of isolation and his sense that his siblings don't actually love or accept him and therefore he's like willing to do these things and he's also cognizant that some of them like betraying his siblings to the white witch are wrong um but he feels sort of incapable of stopping himself as well um i really enjoyed that added detail and i think the scene worked well uh and even works well now even with dated special effects because the primary function of it isn't to be aesthetically pleasing it's to be emotionally compelling yeah i really like it too i i don't think we get that same inner tor- inner turmoil from edmund in this is in chapter 9 as he's kind of going to the witch's house we don't get that as much and i actually really like it here it makes me empathize with him a little bit like oh man i felt like this sometimes with Maybe my siblings, or I've been, you know, I've just been, everyone's been frustrated at a sibling before. And so you can kind of relate to him. And in the book, as he's walking to the witch's house, you're just kind of like, what a jerk. He's like, he wants to like, like, you know, punish beavers and build all these roads and he's going to punish his siblings. And you don't really feel bad for him at this, in this moment, but here I really do. So this is, this is an example of something they added that I really, really like. Yeah. And I also think it's something they added that is in keeping with sort of Lewis's storytelling. Because I, I, in the book, sure, Edmund comes off much harsher and like much more selfish than he does in this film. But over the course of subsequent books, we get a softer, more responsible, more caretaking Edmund as he grows up and as he experiences things uh, and becomes somebody who earns the name Edmund the Just. Whereas here, we're getting that ahead of time. We're getting that in this adaptation so we don't... And I think it's an intentional choice so viewers don't have to deal with a character who they just don't like for the whole run of the miniseries. It helps us see his arc towards heroism before it comes, so we can accept it when it does. Yeah, it, it, this is one of my, like you're saying, and this is what makes it one of my favorite additions to the entire thing. Anything else, Trent, from this um, chapter before we move on? I think it's it's worth noting that the the castle is pretty pretty cool uh the set for the castle again is pretty cool it's the first one that looks more theatrical and fabricated like i imagine the walls are probably like styrofoam or plywood or something um sure, sure. but it also is claustrophobic and effective uh and creepy so i like i like that it's there i like that they bothered to create a full sort of throne room for uh, Edmund and the White Witch to interact in with Maugrim. Um, and so that's where we end is in that space with the White Witch planning her assault on Aslan and the Pevensies. And I really like the lighting in her castle as well, too. I think it's it, it, it just evokes fear in me and this kind of also sense of like emptiness in her being evil. Like it literally is pretty empty and it just feels like, oh, like you don't want to be there. You know, like it's, I, I, I can empathize with Edmund as his realization as he gets to this castle that's supposed to be his castle eventually. And it's just, 
it's not what he expected at all. And so I, I, I really like the set for her. I mean, I really am liking most of these sets in general. One thing about the, um, the, the scene where she's sitting by herself in the castle and Edmund's kind of off to the side eating his stale bread. It's like, what, what does she do all day? It seems like she's just <laughs> sitting in the, in the middle of the room, not doing anything. And I actually had that problem with a lot of scenes where there's someone of royalty just sitting there. It's like, what? That looks awful. <laughs> like, shouldn't you be like riding letters or like riding a horse or something? It makes more sense when she's riding around on, on her sledge, but um, when she's just sitting there in the middle of the room, it's particularly odd. Yeah, and I think that in this case, like, cool because it's demonstrative of the fact that her power in this place is pretty hollow in the grand scheme of things. But, like, it is a cinematic trope where you just have, like, a king in the throne room. What I love to see is when they change that. So we know our protagonist character is coming in. But as they come in, some other character who has addressed the king is being taken out either in glory or in woe as they're, like, taken to be executed or something. Um, And that lets us know, like, oh, the reason you're sitting in the throne room is to, like, pass judgment on situations in the kingdom. Whereas, like, here the White Witch has no reason to be hanging out except for maybe she's, like having a chat with her horse driving guy (laughs) (laughs) all right so let's move on to episode four which begins with the wit the witch making ready her sledge and it goes all the way to the arrival at aslan's camp so we get father christmas in this the kids get their gifts we see the witch kind of heading out and spring comes to narnia let's talk about it what are some things that stick out to y'all the thing that stuck out to me uh, is this is the first one where there were two scenes where they were trying to withhold information from the audience to build tension. Uh, the first being Margrim is racing towards the beaver's house while Miss Beaver is comedically debating whether or not to bring her sewing machine. And she's like rummaging through all the cabinets to find food for them to take and all this stuff, which is really like human and really cool and a funny sequence, if frustrating. Um, and really, yeah, I was going to say really annoying. And like <laughs> perhaps played a little too long. But what's cool is they, they do intentionally make us think perhaps they're all still at the house when Mogram arrives. Um, and the same thing happens when we see the White Witch's sledge and then we see uh, the Pevensies and the Beavers hiding and hearing a sleigh approaching and hearing hooves approaching. And in this case, book readers know that it's not the White Witch, it's Father Christmas, but people watching would, in both of those situations, feel that tension. And so it's just another instance of where they actually did try to use the medium to create a sensation that the book creates as well, which is this tension of like, are they going to escape? Are they in danger? Um, Who is it that's some mystery, some intrigue? Um, Both were heavy handed, but both were effective and fun. Yeah, I, that scene with um, Mrs. Beaver just really goes on a long time. I remember when we were watching it, um, it was just like, man, this, they're really playing it up. Like, it it went a little too long, even for that scene. And I think they played Aslan's theme like 10 times in that same scene, too. <laughs> over and over and over. Every decision uh, she made gets a little French horn fanfare. Like, <laughs> I will take the sewing machine. <laughs> um. <laughs> So they get to that cave, and and when they're in the cave, we get a good shot of the fact that the beavers are pretty much just wearing, like, leather gloves. (laughs) But we we finally get Father Christmas, and I think the costumes and the design of Father Christmas and his sleigh really kind of highlight the fact that it is weird that Santa Claus is in Narnia. Like, his sleigh is, like, bright green and red. Like, it is super Christmassy. Which, I, I mean, obviously, it is Christmas, but I think in, in the book, when I think about it, and then when we see it in other adaptations, it's a little bit more almost like regal in a way, and a little bit more magical and still like a step away from our world. Whereas in this one, it's just like, here's literally they transported Santa Claus exactly into our world, into Narnia, and it, it really feels out of place to me. It's kind of like we're reviewing all your old... Um... <laughs> I know. Gripes, but it's like you've been re-triggered. I'm sorry, listeners. I'm going to have to get into talking about how great The Last Jedi is soon, too, just to kind of go through all the things I talk about in every episode. Oh, um, man. Our voicemails are getting full, though. So like... i got to stop that, yeah. Um, guys, Susan gets four arrows when she gets her gift. <laughs> what, what is that about? Have like, you, I, okay, Daniel doesn't watch SNL, but there's a... Trent, have you seen the SNL with Hawkeye from the Avengers movies? Uh, I, I know. 
Okay, there's this great scene where the actor for Hawkeye, Jeremy, is it Jeremy yeah, Renner? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Jeremy Renner is actually playing Hawkeye, and so everyone else is playing a different character from the Avengers. And he like runs up, he goes, "Hey guys, I'm about to head out," and they're in the middle of a battle. They're like, "What? Like we've only been here like 20 minutes?" And he's like, "Yeah, well, I only have like six arrows, and I used them all." <laughs> <laughs> they're like, "You only brought six arrows?" He's like, "Yeah." They're like, there are hundreds of bad guys. He's like, yeah, and I shot six of them. You're welcome. <laughs> That's what I think of when I see Susan with her four arrows. Well, I don't I don't think she uses them, so maybe that's why she doesn't need. I, I just it seems weird. Why would you give someone four arrows? Well, when all of your antagonists are just colored pencil drawings on film, <laughs> like what what good are your arrows gonna be anyway? <laughs> they just go right through them. Yeah. Oh it's... man, we have to we have to talk about that when we get to the fighting scene where they're fighting the animated flame <laughs> with a sword. I just someone needs to explain the mythology behind that. Well, and and along with those gifts. You know, Peter's gifts, super cool. I think they look awesome. They look very Narnian to me. Lucy's cordial is maybe holds about a drop of her like magic juice. Like it is so so small <laughs> that I it just I don't know. I don't I don't like the the uh, production design of that because it just seems so. Maybe that's the point. Maybe I'm missing the point. It's that it is magic, and so therefore she doesn't need a lot of it. Like only you know only need one drop. So. I think that is like the shtick is like she literally okay. needs one drop and in it she's like it, in the final battle I don't I suppose I'm jumping ahead a little bit but she administers it to people like she's literally just puts a drop and weirdly like sticks her finger on their gums and kind of like <laughs> spreads it around a little bit and it's like there you go just just some gingivitis treatment uh, and then they like go on their merry way and they're fine. Hey, let, let's make an alternative version of this film where instead of Lucy going just a minute Aslan she goes oh I'm, I'm actually out <laughs> I I used I used both drops on Edmund because <laughs> he's my brother and I wanted to help him and then he's done yeah uh, I wanted to give him a little extra juice yeah I mean what else do we think about this scene with uh with Santa here I honestly like don't really I, I think you said it and I honestly don't really remember like this whole episode to me is painfully uneventful Maybe because so much of the runtime is eaten up by the great sewing machine debate of 1988, but um, like, <laughs> oh, nice. I think we just have the we've just found the name of our episode. <laughs> but really, like, of the things that happen, right? We have Margram gets to the Beaver's house. We have they meet Father Christmas, and we have the witch turning some revelers to stone, and that's it. That's that. That's the episode. Like three big events happen. And none of them are particularly memorable because all of them have like a weird pacing or aesthetic choice. And I think this kind of proves something that I said, again, not to repeat myself, but when we covered this in the book, I remember saying this is probably around my least favorite part of the book, like uh, chapter 11, uh, when spring is nearer, as I think, I think is the chapter title. And it, it, again, this is one of my favorite books of all time, so I'm not I'm not ragging on the book, but I think the fact that it doesn't tra- it's it's kind of a in my opinion it's a weaker part of the story uh, in the text, and then even when we adapt it, it's still kind of a weaker part. I think this is probably in my opinion kind of the low point of the book, where we we go and it we this whole journey from them from winter coming to spring it just goes on for a little too long in my opinion. And I think we see that in the fact that even when it's adapted, it still isn't super compelling. It's the it's the breaking of the fellowship issue to me, where like once you've fractured a party in fantasy literature, you have to deal with both halves and you also have to give them plausible motivations to reunite. And so there's a lot of kind of like, OK, so what kind of stuff happens in between that won't change the characters enough that when they come back into the same place, they can't sort of pick up, but also isn't super boring. And so like Lord of the Rings does it really well, but I don't know if you guys have read The Wheel of Time. Like The Wheel of Time does it really poorly, where it has this huge cast of characters and it breaks them up. And like some of them are doing really cool stuff that actually matters to the fantasy world they live in. And others of them are just kind of like, I left my friends, but not for any particular reason. And now I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm literally just gonna wander for two books and then I'll like get home eventually, cool. (laughs) <laughs> like, and I feel similarly about this way. It's just kind of like, yeah, we're trying to get somewhere, but what happens in between just sort of happens. Yep. 
So I actually, I, I've been making a, um, a comic page a day, and this was back in October, and I just finished up recently. Um, but I, I had these two characters there together the whole time, and then I split them up, and it, I immediately had to bring them back together again for that exact same reason. It's like, it's not, like, there wasn't really a point to having one of them be by themselves, but one of them was doing some cool stuff. So it's interesting you bring that up. And I think the strength of it, uh, before we get a bunch of hate mail because we're we're saying negative things about the book, but um, I, I think the strength of this is that this only lasts for a very short period of time. Like I think it's uh, it's a good book and a good story when the most boring part of it is in a movie is about thirty minutes long of a three hour movie, and in a book for me is just one chapter. So I I think it's so you can hold your hate mail. You don't have to send it to us. Actually send it to Trent. That's totally fine with me. Um but don't just don't send it to our show. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh it's nice to be a guest. You know, I feel very welcome. <laughs> very welcome. This will probably yeah, I'm sure Trent's not gonna want to come back <laughs> after this. Uh no, that's hey, that's what we're here for. We're not just talking about good stuff. We're here to dissect all of it. So um any other things about this episode before we move on to a more exciting one? I think we should. I think we should move on to episode five now that we've <laughs> thoroughly trounced episode four. Uh, so episode five is the arrival at Aslan's camp, and all the way to unfortunately Aslan's death. So I, I want to start out just by asking you guys about the portrayal of Aslan and what what y'all think of it. Um, I at first really was kind of like oh wow that looks pretty good um but the more time we spend with aslan the limitations of this sort of performance become clear um and so i think that's that's where i get sort of bummed out and it's not their fault like i think they do the puppetry is actually really good and the voice acting for aslan is also really 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 good um there's just a few moments where like when he gets on the stone table like when they lift him onto the stone table and it's like very obviously like kind of this stiff stuffed animal-esque lion that they are lifting up it's it's a that's where i'm kind of like oh man i wish they had better resources at the time or like a, a more mobile puppet but honestly i i dig this version of aslan except for the roar he's awesome yeah that roar yeah i i like him too i it didn't as a child, but it does take me out of it a little bit because his mouth does not match up to the words that he's saying. And I understand why, because he's a puppet and this is not Jim Henson, you know, or yeah, or Frank Oz, right? But it takes me out of it a little bit, but not enough from like it completely destroys it for me. And as a kid, I don't even know if I noticed. That's like my only kind of critique of it that something that you haven't mentioned is the, the way that his mouth doesn't necessarily line up with his words. It takes me out of it a little bit. Yeah, it's hard for me to know how much of this is, you know, me being older than a kid. Because I, when I was a kid, I didn't notice either. Or is it like things are just different than they were when we were filming stuff in the 80s and the 90s? I, I think it's both, right? Like, I think we are both, old, we're, we are all older than when we first saw this. And television and film look a lot different than they did 30 years ago. I think it's both. Yeah, and I mean... This one also isn't like a Hollywood film because I'm thinking like a, a contemporary film with similar puppetry. You take something like uh, the, the Never Ending Story, right? And you have the Luck Dragon. That is like a crazy puppet, huge Aslan in proportion, Aslan in narrative function. Um, and I still look back on it and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. This is a TV miniseries puppet that I look back on it and I'm like, that's mostly really cool. Uh, very effective when he's standing, not very effective when he has to move. Um, sure, sure. The in in episode six when he flies, man, that's that was for me the the low point for Aslan. But the actual portrayal of the character is spot on. Like I think they do a really good job with the portrayal of the character. There's the uh, the shot, or really the sequence of shots when Malgram shows up to fight Peter. Uh, and everything goes red. And that's another thing, just like, I guess Malgram just really sticks with me as a kid because I remember the letter really well, and I distinctly remembered the fight having a, a red background. And I, I don't know if I love it and just love the boldness of like, hey, we're going to just change the background on you, or if I just hate that decision. I really am not sure. It's a, I like it because it's an accommodation for the other limitations, right? They can't, 
both of the like real brutal act well all three of the brutal action scenes in this meaning this fight uh the sacrifice of aslan and then the final battle they don't really show you anything bad or lethal happening it's all out of frame uh and so to give that sense of stakes they had to do something i like the decision to make it red it makes an otherwise low stakes pretty comedically poorly choreographed fight scene like illustrate how dangerous and like sort of violent and experienced this is for peter that's an excellent point yeah i think that is a little odd to me that it's suddenly turning red but i prefer that to not having it red okay i think without the red background like i'm trying to visualize it in my head and all of the clunkiness of it would be like tenfold which is surprising to me that like a weird bold choice like that actually ameliorates the visual uh, limitations of the scene, but it, it really does because it gives us something else to sort of focus on and bring us into the scene instead of trying to make a sword fight that doesn't actually happen be high stakes. I guess so. There's a, so after that battle, there's a really cool shot, probably my favorite shot in the entire uh, serial here. Uh, and I, I just mean from Lime Witch of the Wardrobe, I guess. Is that, when we say serial, do we, does that mean all of Narnia, all the Chronicles of Narnia here? Is that just talk? I don't understand how British stuff works. I would just like to point out that every time you say British serial, I think of like Cheerios or. <laughs> That's. <laughs> You're really pulling me Cheerios out of the story. Cheerios are British because they say I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> That's why I chose that one. <laughs> no one's answered my question, though. <laughs> <laughs> what was your question? I'm preoccupied with British serials. Yeah, when is the serial? Because that's how they do. They do like like even like Sherlock and other British shows that are really popular over uh, over here in the United States. They do, and they don't have seasons. They have series, and then different episodes in a series. When we say serial, does that refer to all of the Chronicles of Narnia, or is that just referred to the line, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? So, to me, the definition of serial as a as a media thing is just saying it's a story that's released in it installments right it's a story that's released in regularly scheduled installments so comic books are serials magazines are serials mini series are serials i think when we call when we refer to this as a serial to me because of uh the nature of television we'd refer to the whole thing as like the serial bbc narnias and then this is the lion the witch and the wardrobe series like okay this is that like chunk of it because then they did the prince caspian and the dawn shredder combined and they did Silver Chair. Well, then, my favorite shot in the... Se- the Oh, man. My favorite shot in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is as the witch is coming to meet Aslan, the camera kind of does this really cool framing shot where it, it has the stone table in the foreground, and it kind of moves around the stone table as the witch is walking closer to Aslan and, and as Aslan is walking closer to her. And it's really the only time... One of the we're not not the only, but one of the few times where there's any kind of camera technique, like you said, that isn't like just some kind of like middle shot kind of thing. Do you guys did y'all notice that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a cool uh, yeah. way to use a focal point to get our audience attention, and then if we wanted to dissect it, we can point towards how both of these characters are going to sort of convene at that for landmark transitions for each of them. Um, but I also think like, it's just, it's important in that sequence in particular, since we're in a space where there's a lot of literal space, like the shot has to take up space for the camera to move because a wide shot of that would, uh, a stable wide shot would emphasize the stiltedness of Aslan. It would take a long time. And so this gives us some, it's, it's effective. And that's what I really like about it is I genuinely think like this film is maybe workmanlike in its direction, but I, the older I get, the less I think that that's a problem because it serves the story really well. Um. Yeah, I agree. Let's get to something big here. Um, there's some cartoon animals in, <laughs> in this movie. Uh, I think, is it rotoscoping? Is that what they did to, to include them here? I don't know exactly the technique that's used. Maybe y'all can answer that, but what do y'all think about both the good and bad creatures that are, you know, cartoon characters? Uh, I love them. I think it's, again, I've said this many times, but I love the fact that this uh, whole miniseries 
has a storybook feel to it. The costumes are like a childhood theater imagination of an anthropomorphized character. The mythical creatures are puppets or they're drawn onto the frame with ink or pencil or whatever it is that they've rotoscoped it on with. Um, I, I really enjoy that. I think it's definitely aged and it's got a weird sort of aesthetic, but it's an aesthetic that like has a timeless quality to it, a timeless sort of fantasy feeling to it. Um, similar to how like hand-drawn animation like still feels cool, even if the trend now is, even if it's supposed to look hand-drawn, it's done on a computer, it's done digitally. Like we always will, I think there will always be a warmth to that. There's a warmth to these mythical creatures being cartoonishly drawn onto the frame. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, Phil, think... you're an illustrator, so tell us. I, I, I want to know your thoughts on this. Yeah, I love I love the design of the characters, but um, from a storytelling point of view, in 2018, it pulls me out of the story just because it's like so different than the live action stuff going on beforehand. Um, one part they did really well though is it legitimately looks like the sword is going through a character later on. And they did a good job of like actually incorporating the two in there. But I just think that's really difficult to do. And I think part of it for me is the colors. Like the colors are so different than um, the background behind it. But you also need stuff to stand out. So I, I appreciate it as a kind of like time capsule example of what stuff looked like at, at that time period. Yeah, I think I like it. I think I'm um, I think I'm in the middle of y'all as far as how much I like it. I think for me it really just depends on which creature it is. I think for some like there's y'all there's literally like a white sheep ghost <laughs> that's on the witch's side and like I'm not a fan of that. Like it just looks like someone is literally just under like someone just drew a cartoon of like Charlie Brown dressed up for Halloween. And yeah, I don't And he got a rock. Yeah. <laughs> um I don't necessarily like that, but I think for the most part, especially with all the different flying creatures that are on Aslan's side, I think I really like it. And I don't, I don't know if that's my nostalgia kicking in because I, I really specifically remember that as a kid. But I, I think for the most part, I, I really enjoy it. And like Trent's been saying the whole time, it serves the story and it makes it feel, it makes it feel magical. Yeah, something I'll say is I think this book, and I don't know if you guys would agree with me, and it's been a long, t- long time since I've read the book, but I think this book, a lot of the narrative devices do a good job of letting it remain plausible that Narnia is imaginary. Uh, it is plausible that the man of the house is sort of agreeing with their fantasy out of an encouraging place rather than a place of shared experience. It's plausible that the whole idea of time passing differently is a way for the children to have imagined having done all this even if they're just in the wardrobe for a couple minutes or just playing their game for half an hour or whatever the case may be um so there's a lot of that space where there's still plausibility for this to be imaginary or real and it's up to the reader to decide if they want to believe alongside the pevensies or not um as later books go on i think that it becomes clear where lewis stands on that spectrum of narnia's reality um but i at least in my memory, I liked that this book gave allocations for readers to decide whether or not they thought what happened in Narnia was real. And so I like that the uh, the film has a sense of imaginary unreality to its portrayal of Narnia, where it, it could all be the way the children are imagining it, or it could all be totally real and experiences they're actually having. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because I would be someone who would be completely on the opposite side in saying that Narnia is 100% real. And that's like an, like an important part of the story. too. And I think you're right that as it goes on, I think with this first book and this first story, there is some, you know, even with the professor's kind of uh, dialogue at the end of the book, you can, there is a little bit of kind of wiggle room there. But I think as it goes on, it becomes very clear that Narnia... Um, to us as readers, Narnia is really happening to these kids. Oh, I totally um, agree. I just think like this book in particular leaves us that wiggle room, and using that is is meaningful. Like using that in okay. our adaptation yeah, yeah, yeah. is meaningful. I I think if you've read the whole series or even at the end of this one, you're supposed to be on the side of the Pevensies. You're supposed to say like Narnia is uh-huh. real. These events happened. Uh, the island isn't purgatory. 
Like you're supposed to <laughs> like feel that way. Um, yeah. But I think later books are where it becomes like ironclad that that is. Sure, fact. sure. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we move later on because I, I want to know if you feel differently about it becoming more ironclad. We can't talk about it now because Phil hasn't gotten there, but, but yeah, we'll, we'll have to get your thoughts later on as we, we travel through the books. Any last things about episode five here? I, I think it's time for us to just dive into the finale. All right, so the last episode is Aslan's death to the Pevensey's return to our world. Let's talk Let's talk about Lizardmen. Can we just jump right into the Lizardmen on the witch's side? Uh, I think you're referring to the the Gorn. Wait, what is is this has a name? Oh, no. The Gorn is the the creature that uh Captain Kirk fights in episode 18 oh. of Star Trek. Um <laughs> <laughs> So that's like definitely a reference that maybe uh, your listenership won't get. Obviously but. when I, yeah, I've only I'm like a I'm a TNG guy. I'm, I haven't really watched a lot of the original series. It was my immediate thought when the witch suddenly had lizard men on her side. I was just like, "Oh my gosh, it's the Gorn." So. <laughs> yeah, I mean the in that final battle, she's got some uh I just looked up a Gorn. Yes, 100% yes. This is incredible. That's exactly what it is. Uh, I'll put a, a link in our the episode description for listeners to check out. And Phil, just so just so people understand how excited you were about this, uh, Daniel jumped up, paused it, and ran up to the screen and took a photo. <laughs> and then two minutes later saw a better shot with two of them and jumped up, paused it, and took another picture and posted it, I think, on Facebook or Twitter. It was on t- I was live tweeting us watching it uh, That's right, when we yeah, were yeah. watching it. So I, I put some up stuff up there. Phil asked which one was Leonardo and which one was Donatello. So he didn't go to Star Trek. He went to TMNT. <laughs> yeah. I love the names of the, the witch's allies. She has ghouls, boggles, cruels, hags, specters, people of the toadstools, incubi, wraiths, horrors, efreets, orkneys, sprites, woozes, ettins. Like, and I don't think any of those, I don't think they ever named the Gorn. And I think that's why they're so evil is they feel unacknowledged. Yeah. Um, they could, C.S. Lewis couldn't even write it. It was so up, upsetting to everybody. <laughs> he didn't want to scare the kids too much. Uh, do we, do y'all like this battle here at the end? Uh, I like the scene of Aslan going and reviving the people who have been petrified the creatures mm-hmm. and people who have been petrified by the White Witch. I like Rumble Buffin kicking the gates open uh, at the castle um, just because you see his toes kind of peek through the other side of the gate. And it's yeah, like, yeah. it's a very cool little, I'm almost positive that they shot that in mini where they had like a real human kick a mini gate open. Sure, um, sure. But I don't love the last battle for the reasons that Phil was mentioning earlier. I think it's the limitations of these uh, drawing of spooky characters. Like the drawings of the spooky characters are cool, especially the drawings of the heroic characters like you mentioned. I love the drawings of like the Pegasus and the Sphinx um, and the Chimera. I don't like the drawings of the flying flame skulls and the Charlie Brown ghosts. And fighting those is just impossible because you know the actors don't know they're there. And no matter oh, how, no. how good of a job the artists do of making it look like the swords make contact, it's still like there's no physicality to it. There's no like sense of contact in the actor's performance. And so it just feels like we're all just sort of swinging around and like doing a weird rave dance. Like you could edit this with like <laughs> flashing lights and sure, trap sure. music and it would make sense. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, What I think is interesting is one of the biggest criticisms I often hear of the Disney adaptation of this book is that it tries, especially with the last battle, to be like very Lord of the Rings-esque, right? So it kind of goes for some big battle, even though we really don't see that in the book at all. I would argue that this adaptation is closer to the book's battle. Some I wonder if some people really like this battle better because it's more in line with the book. Or if people are like, no, I actually like that they kind of expanded it and it's this huge epic battle on this on the plains of Narnia. But I I, I think, yeah, I think it kind of it just doesn't have a lot of weight here in, in the BBC version. One thing I've noticed so you know like in Star Wars they use actual like props for the lightsaber fights. Mm-hmm. And there's actual contact being made. It would look ridiculous if they weren't actually holding anything. 
And I think that's part of the problem they ran into here, like you guys were talking about, where it doesn't look like they're actually making contact with anything or they actually know where the stuff is, which is why it's so important to have, you know, someone in like a green suit with a prop to show you like where to make eye contact with if you're going to add a CGI character or a rotoscoped animation character later. Um, and, you know, maybe they just didn't know or didn't have the budget for that. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I do. I do think it's effective, and I think the the scene of the White Witch's death is one of the only times that we see um, sort of lethality in it as it happens. You know, Aslan, we see the aftermath, but we cut away for the actual impact, which is fine and natural. You know, it's for children. Um, the same is true with Mogram. Uh, out of frame is when the sword enters, but with the White Witch, and I, I wonder why that's okay for us as an audience like why is it okay for us to see the white witch like lying broken on the ground is it just because she's evil Mogrim was evil too um but that scene plays out exactly how it does in the book and so in that way i agree with you like the fidelity to the book is powerful there um but i preferred the epic battle simply because it gave me an opportunity to see that this was challenging for the heroes, for the Pevensies. Here, I don't feel like any of the Pevensies actually feel like they're in mortal danger, except for Edmund. But here's why I think that that epic battle is less in line with Lewis's work, though. And we talked about this when, when David was on the show and they were charging towards the battle. Lewis kind of has his climax of the book be Aslan's death and resurrection and not necessarily the battle. And it's like that's why even though the battle hasn't happened yet in chapter 16, there's a lot of joy and excitement for what's to come. Even though there's a giant battle, there's not really much tension there. It's almost like, well, look, if Aslan has conquered death, then what's the, you know, what are the stakes for this battle? And so, you know, we go to the battle, it's like two paragraphs and it's over. Like they win really, really easily. Pretty much in the first charge of Aslan's army, they wipe out the entire witch's army for the most part. But in the movie, the climax is de- – like the Disney movie, the climax is 100% the battle. And so I, I want – and I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I enjoy the movie's take on it a lot. But I, I do think this book keeps in line with Lewis's work, which is that the climax is Aslan's resurrection. And the battle is just like a formality we have to do to finish the book almost or finish the story. Hmm. In that, like with that sort of closeness to the text, then this makes – total sense you know like this that's exactly how this battle feels is not like a climax it feels like a footnote um and i do think like the the way they did aslan's sacrifice scene did feel like a high stakes like sort of uh climax so both these scenes are done effectively for the book they feel ineffective in movie format because of i suppose what we're expecting um as viewers and sort of what is classic narrative pacing, especially in Western film, right? Like for us, narrative pacing in almost everything, that battle where the characters sort of resolve their conflicts, put to rest their demons, like end it uh, is is where the ending actually comes. Uh, And with the sort of symbolism, Aslan has already ended it. It's already done. Um, So the battle is a formality. But as an, as an audience member, that's hard to translate. Yeah, I don't think it works well on the screen. I think it's I think it works. This story works better if the I, I think the story works better in a movie if the climax is the battle. So I, and I think that's why it feels I mean, technically, almost the climax happens at the very beginning of this last chapter. And then we just kind of have to finish it out. It's. I think it's the same problem that Return of the King has. In, uh, the book, I mean, well, really just the end of Lord of the Rings, technically, has where there's so much stuff after the book, it feels like, well, wait, what is the climax? Is the climax the destruction of the ring? or Because we still have the scourging of the Shire and all this other stuff. And I I, I think it works best when, when the climax is the battle. And maybe that's just because it's what I'm used to. And Lewis and Tolkien in that respect are kind of pushing up against that and challenging that idea. And so maybe it's it's me that needs the change. Hmm. Any last thoughts before we wrap up the movie? I do want to conclude by saying if, if anybody has listened to this and gotten the impression I don't love these, you're, I do. Um, 
Uh, but I felt it was our obligation to fully suss them out, fully uh, dissect these films so you can enjoy them with whole new eyes. It'll be like you're watching them for the first time, which is like a privilege I wish I could have. That's right. I love the little details, like when they're playing hide and seek and Susan waits until they leave the room and then speeds up the counting. I think, Daniel, you said like that's the most realistic part of this movie. Yeah, <laughs> children doing that and hide and go seek. Yeah, I I think for me, I love that it feels real. Like even like, and it's it's ironic because despite some of the production values and some of the way that this this has aged, it still feels very real to me. And again, it, it might just be nostalgia. Like this might be something that when we show our kids one day, they're just like, "This is horrible. I can't do it." You know. And I, I mentioned before that we I've showed the first episode to my fourth graders once, and they like could not handle it like it just was so old and so different than what they were used to uh, as kids who were born you know in like 2007 2008 they just they really could not stay with it and it really really challenged them so I wonder what this adaptation will be like 30 years from now and if it'll still be something that we're talking about and invested in when the people who are our age didn't grow up with it they grew up with the Disney version you know or the Netflix version oh that's also true all right, well, Trent, before we let you go, we have asked all of our guests two questions, and so we're going to ask you them here. The first one we're going to ask you is kind of what your relationship was and still is with the Chronicles of Narnia. Like, when did you first read them? Did you enjoy them when you first read them? Was it something you picked up later as an adult? And then what is your favorite book of the series? Uh, okay, question one. I first read them in the second grade. I had an awesome teacher named Miss Mishy, and like I've I'm a librarian at a middle school. I'm a teacher at a middle school now. So obviously I love books. So I've been an avid reader my whole life. Um, but I had exhausted a ton of the books that were immediately recommended to kids and stuff. And so she recommended Narnia to me in the second grade. And I read the whole series that year. I loved them. Um, I think I did skip one. I think I skipped the horse and his boy because I was like, this isn't the same thing. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Um, and so I skipped it and went back later, maybe the next year. Um, so that was my introduction and I liked them from the get go. I've always, fantasy has always been a genre of literature that I have loved and returned to. Um, my favorite book, as I mentioned before, the same as my favorite uh, adaptation. I love the silver chair. Uh, I think it has a darker tone. I think it has really relatable and new protagonists. I love that the Narnian children, the explorers in that book, get a companion who is not Aslan, who's not like Mr. Tumnus, who's kind of like clumsy and weird. Um, and so that that's definitely my favorite book. Full stop. No questions. That's good. I like. I I love the silver chair too, and I think it's. I think you you bring up really good points about Puddle Glum, and we can't talk anymore because Phil doesn't doesn't know. But that's really cool. You're the first person who's had the silver chair be their favorite, and so I'm I'm glad that we have a lot of diversity and opinions here. Any last thoughts before we let you go, Trent? Uh, no. Thank you for having me on. This has been a pleasure. Uh, I hope all of your listeners go out and watch these delightful films, and perhaps try making Turkish delight. <laughs> thanks for being yeah, on yeah thanks Trent we really appreciate it so listeners you can follow us into Narnia on our Twitter or Facebook pages if you have any feedback or we'd also just love to hear your thoughts on the BBC adaptation email us at the Narnia podcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 406-646-6733 we'd also appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts and this helps other listeners find the show and join together with us our show's themes were created by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more of his work in the links in the episode's description. Thank you so much for coming along on this journey, and we'll be back next time to discuss Disney's 2005 adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe.